Uh, kia ora tato. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Ruby Moore, and I'm going to talk to you today, along with Tom Rowlands, about a project that we've been working on together. Uh, so the name is CSI Pukekawa. We, it's not crime scene investigation, but citizen science investigations. <laughs> so um, it's, it's actually been a really interesting process present, putting this presentation together because it started as quite a um, vague idea. I, we kind of knew what we wanted to do, but to actually put it together in a way that we can explain to um, our colleagues and other people is, has been really useful. So I work in the natural sciences department at the museum. I specifically manage the entomology and land vertebrate collections. So mo most, uh, most days I'll be in the collection working on trays of really cool bugs and insects. Um, and birds, uh, but we also do get some time to go out into the field and do some collections and um, getting out, engaging with people as well. So quite a what well, an incredibly varied job. I'm never quite sure what the week's going to ha um, be have in store for me. So just a beginning to get everyone a bit familiar. If you're not sure where um, the museum is, it is in the CBD of Auckland. So uh, we've got a little pocket of um, greenery in the museum in the middle of that, but all around there we've got urbanised city and lots and lots of people, cars and roads. So this is where most of us staff spend most of our time. We get, get inside the doors and we spend um, eight hours and sometimes we don't actually go outside because we're so busy. But we've got this really, really cool backyard which unfortunately not that many people know so much about. So there's this little remnant patch of forest um, in the Auckland domain, which is just a few um, moments from our front doorstep of the museum. And in this forest is actually some really cool things. So I've, been, I've got a personal history going to there since I was a kid because I grew up in Auckland and I always thought this was particularly exciting being you could... You can hear the city around you, but you're in this complete forest. So that was kind of a cool juxtaposition. Um, but in my career, one of the first bioblitzes that I was involved with was in the domain in 2005. So a bioblitz is a 24-hour survey where you get lots of biologists um, surveying an area, and it's a big public event as well. So you've got lots and lots of people turning up, and you're all out fossicking, hunting, and identifying, and... Um, counting up the number of species. So it's a big public engagement event, but also with those we get some pretty cool observations. So um, the Band of Kokopu is one that was significant to me, um, found in the domain, a population of those, but also some uh, the caddisfly there, the pseudoechinesis, that was a really unusual find being in the, in the stream I, I've never seen this species before, it's really un, unusual, and it was just in this tiny little drain in the domain. So that got me really excited. But the kokapu, uh, there were an, about five of these really large kokapus living in the stream just um, near the railway station. And these are one of the white bait species, so um, we've heard a lot about those lately in the news. Uh, having adults, an adult population, that's kind of a good sign. Uh, but just a couple of years ago, some um, colleagues previous from a previous job were saying they'd been in these streams and they hadn't found any fish and they're wondering if I found any. And I was like, actually, I've even got a record because we did this survey. So they had no records, but we went out and I was like, I know they're there. <laughs> I'm going to find them. And I got a few fish experts and we went down and um, tra went through trapping these fish. And... I was very, very excited because we found a tiny juvenile. And so this was just last year. So that was particularly cool because there was a, I was thinking, oh no, those old big ones, that's the end of a population, maybe there's no recruitment. One of these things about fish, our native fish, they have to migrate from the sea. So all these fish, they would have had to travel through the city pipes to get up to the domain stream. So they've gone right from downtown Auckland through whatever those waters are like to the stream. So this little juvenile is a really, really good sign, happy sign for me. 
Um, so uh, about two years ago, me and some of the other museum staff were saying, you know, we want to have a project going on in the domain. We want to, we didn't have a particular name. It was just kind of roughly called the, the Domain Nature Project. Um, we, we didn't put too many parameters on it, but we started talking to the other curators and staff and getting them out. Uh, we've kick-started Matt Rayner and Josie Galbraith to replicate the bird studies from um, that Brian gilded 30 years ago. So it's a year-long study um, documenting exactly how many birds w are observed over a year. So they're going to be, they're, we're halfway through that one and they'll be publishing that up. So it'll be this really neat inner urban comparison of scientific data. Uh, the fish surveys, that's something I've been involved with. And freshwater surveys, e every time I go down, Tom will vouch, I get so excited because I find so many mayflies in those streams. And when I used to work in the Waitakere Ranges, well, I mean, I get excited at one, but getting so many, they're one of these indicators of really good fresh water, um, really good water quality and habitat. So to find them in the city, city stream, which is dubious water quality possibly, I don't know, I don't know what's happening here, but it's really cool and it's consistent. So every time I go down, there's a cool new species to find. Um, also entomology, I, I got a few uh, notes from John Early, the curator, and he was like, well, yeah, basically, um, urban, the CBD of Auckland is one of the least represented habitat types for our entomology collection. So we've got these amazing collections from all over New Zealand, all over the world, but not that many people actually go out collecting in the CBD area. We've got a few, but, and right there in our doorstep, we've got all these unusual species, undescribed species, and entomology undescribed doesn't actually mean that unique because so many insects aren't described yet either. But just the fact that we can do research, we can possibly help identify some new species um, from our backyard without having to go on a massive expedition. Uh, I just had to sneak this one in. You, you can't take an entomologist or pretty much an ologist anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, you go out to get coffee and you find some bag moths in the tree. Um, going to the beach, I mean, who wouldn't, who wouldn't pick up a cute little maggot? <laughs> That's a kelp fly, it's a particular, I've been converted to those from John recently. So, and this is, this has developed over time into, uh, we wanted to get more science happening in our backyard. We uh, decided iNaturalist was quite a good way to, um, quite a good vehicle to use some of that data. So this is an online citizen science um, program. So you enter your observations of your natural, your plants, your animals, your fungi, uh, various different things. And this is, this is a global website, so it's available for anyone to see. So if you put up your cool mayfly, then anyone in the world can see it. And they, they, the scientists or other observers get a chance to um, identify it, say what they think it could be. And you get this online community of um, people saying, oh, it's this species, not that species, and you get to um, get an identification at the end, hopefully. So we started getting lots of sci um, staff out um, doing this um, during their lunch breaks or wherever. And this is the page that we set up. So this, we set this page up in 2018 and you can see around then there was about 700 um, observations. This just collects any person who's put, put an observation in a particular, on our map area. And just, I downloaded this screenshot from just the other day, and we're now up to 1,600 and so observations, and lots, lots of observers, lots of species. And what I was particularly pleased with is when, when we set up most, most of the observations tended to be birds, introduced birds or white-faced heron that everyone seems to see because it's on the field and, you know, it's the kind of the obvious thing. Or some of the things from the winter gardens, like all these flash flowers that are growing in the um, hothouse there. But I was quite pleased here to see the top, oh, the top is still a bird, but we've got some native plants down there. And one of my mayflies has cre crept up to their most observed species. 
Oh, okay. Speed up. So that's just that's our map of our observations, and you can see already we're getting a lot in there. This is the cool mayfly. So these ones only live in um, really good water quality habitat, and for some reason there are hundreds of them down in the domain, urban site. Pycnocentria, another one that don't often see, and I'm personally trying to investigate why we're finding so many of these cool species just in the domain here. Uh, it's also providing some really cool leads for um, further research, so scientists, lots of scientists keep an eye on this. Uh, this is a lace swing that was found, an introduced species, and it popped up on iNaturalist, so of course we got our nets and went out looking. We also found a tortoise beetle, a hatter beetle, another beetle, and a lace wing. <laughs> so that, that's just a 10 minute uh, field trip. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's been a really cool way of making a connection between staff and public, because you get these little conversations going on um, through the website um, in the, the way that you're identifying and verifying it. And also, just when you're using iNaturalist, it's a good way to encourage people to actually record the details of where they found it and when, because one of the problems is other times we get people just coming to the museum and saying, oh, we found this, but we don't know where or when, and then it makes it not a very good, it's not very useful scientifically. So I have I often wondered whether we, you know, where's the balance between digital and being in nature. But what really convinced me was being out at this incredibly remote place at the top of the North Island. This is away from the domain at the moment. Uh, but this is like so hard to get to, you know, you've got a dirt road, uh, you've got a barge for an hour and there's, you know, there's nothing apart from your little boat. Um, but for some, somehow this was amazingly connected because we were in there with the Nataki school kids and one of the one of the students found this really cool slug, and I was like, I'm not a marine biologist, I don't know what that is. Uh, but we loaded, I was sending photos on my phone, on the barge, and the spray everywhere, and we're getting this instant response from Wilma at the museum, and she's sending it off over to overseas, getting um, these IDs. So I've like got it ID'd, and she's going, oh my God, that's the first time I've ever seen that in New Zealand. And it's actually this unusual blue, ma blue margin head shield slug. So, and this, is, this goes up onto iNaturalist as well, and there's this whole long, big debate about, you know, how exciting this is. So, I mean, this is like, we're in the most remote place you can see, but it's just generating all this excitement. So, that was my learning, that um, I, didn't, I don't think it took over, I don't think it's becoming, it's not replacing the natural experience, but it's actually enhancing it in this, in this way. And to be remote like that, the learning that you can have when you're out in the middle of nowhere and go, I wonder if this is interesting. And then previously you'd be like, I've got to take it to um, down to the museum, and that's much less likely to happen. So I'll pass over to Tom now. And I think these are photos of maggots. Yes, beautiful maggots. These are maggots. <laughs> Um, so naturally the learning team of the museum, oh kia ora, my name's Tom, um, the learning team of the museum turned it into a learning offer, so many hands make light work in this case. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we've always wanted to activate the domain and we want students to go outside and um, we get them to observe species in the domain with this program. Um, well, there are a few parameters that we wanted to set up before we uh, produce this program. Um, so we wanted to enable student agency, so we give them the tools to make their own citizen science projects in their backyard. Uh, doing science, so this is real, um, the photos that they take it, uh, the photos that they take get uploaded onto iNaturalist, which are observed by scientists from around the world, and uh, a lot of researchers springboard observational studies um, yeah, into their research. Um, engaging with scientists, so not only on the iNaturalist app, but also with the museum scientists. So Ruby and her team love to come down with us to actually collect um, other things as well, like mayflies, um, the much-loved mayfly. Um, 
and it complements the new digital curriculum, which is coming out next year, so it's going to be compulsory in all schools, um, digital thinking and becoming um, digitally capable thinkers. And the collaboration of nature and digital, uh, it's quite a big topic, um, but when you get to opposing platforms from nature and digital, that could be a competing thing. Um, but we like to think, think that they complement each other in this case. But you'll see that soon. So in the program, it's pretty simple. They come down with me into the domain. They get into small groups loaded with an iPad. They get explained some rules. And they get to explore the, um, any sort of part inside of the domain. And they get to take lots of photos. They're equipped with a... Um, <clears throat> with a field guide that we've made. So they get this as a pre-resource before they come to the museum to sort of uh, load them up with the different kinds of specimens they could find in the domain too. So the learning doesn't stop with them just taking photos. We do send them a report a couple of weeks after they come, um, a report of all the different kinds of observations that they found. So with total observations um, and all the different kinds of animals, fungi, and um, plants that they find. So I'm going to show you some examples of what students have found in the domain. Firstly, the New Zealand giant centipede, um, which was oh, sorry, which was about that long. Um, that was just sitting in the path. Uh, John Early here is our entomologist, so he is very keen on observing anything that goes into iNaturalist. Um, on to the right is. Ruby's much-loved mayfly. Uh, students have found quite a few of those. Here's a photo of a spider. It's a bit blurry. And some of the scientists and observers um, do actually like to point that out and tell students how to do it properly. So they're saying, I think this photo is just a bit too blurry to give an accurate ID. Something to me that I mean, I don't even think about fungus in my everyday life, but um, a student uploaded this photo of a fungus, and there's an enthusiast down the bottom, David White, who likes to um, tell everybody all about it. What happens to it when it gets older? Here is a photo of a Western mosquito fish. Um, this is something quite important that we've learnt is that people from overseas don't really understand the situation of pests here in New Zealand. So it's the people at the top, you don't really have to read it, but they're quite excited that they found a fish in the middle of the city. Um, but it turns out Western mosquito fish is a big pest, so it's actually illegal to put it back into the, um, the source where you found it. So um, down the bottom, Clinton, who is one of our advisors, it's like, he just says, it's a nasty introduced species. Uh, the following are some bad examples of observations. These are just kids, so give them some slack. Um, one is of a taxidermied penguin <laughs> that's inside the Weird and Wonderful Gallery. Um, the other is of 20 cents. And if you weren't really sure, they had to write down the bottom of the description, which is 20 cents. <laughs> a bit too blurry to identify. <laughs> um, the gorgeous Kit Harrington. Um, it's a photo of a photo in a magazine, so um, Kiwi Fergus says that's not really okay. Um, in case you're wondering, we do teach them about being digi digitally responsible. Um, people from all over the world can see what they're taking photos of, so um, we do monitor that. Numbers. Since it's, um, since it's production, we started in May this year, so we've already had about 600 students over six schools, um, 563 observations that span over 116 species, and 78 identifiers from around the globe have commented on all of their pictures. And the students get to see all of that information too. So I have a little video. Do we have time? Cool. Um, Please excuse my really bad editing skills. Today we went exploring and we found some stuff out of this book. 
Oh, it's a blackbird. Blackbird? It's like, where? where? It's it's right there. It's right there. Where? Oh. I, I see it. Oh. Today we found lots of cool stuff. And we found some interesting insects and took some photos on the iPad. Um, we learned about insects. Um, we found some different insects um, in the creek. And like, we found a snail, eel, and a centipede um, near the tree right there. Um, it was like really huge. And what we're looking at was uh, you know, the life cycle of uh, creepy crawlies. We, they have looked at butterfly, mosquitoes, uh, flies, cockroaches. And then from there out into the nature today, you know, that must have really, really given, given them an insight of what it's all like. Yeah, so yeah, they were quite excited and uh, when we went down, uh, downhill towards the, uh, down the, towards the creek, yeah, my group was so fascinated by the things they saw, yeah. So yes, it makes a big, big difference. My favorite thing was looking at different types of creatures, insects, that I've never seen before or, or heard. Uh, we had found an even more unusual caddis flight in here just by coming down and having a really oh, quick look. Um, so maybe. this one here is probably... Um, where is it? Where is it? Mm -hmm. It looks like it's yeah, yeah. She grabbed the tree, the white tree, and she put it like um, like on the floor. Then she went in the creek and she grabbed the net and then like, scooped up the dirt under the water that she um, she put it inside the um, the tree and all these insects were crawling out of it and then we just took a spoon and and like scooped each insect so we can take a picture of it. After engaging themselves in the classroom when they go out, the things, things in nature, they see things in nature, they were very much en engaged. The group which was working with me, when I could not believe, you know, they were sort of looking at trees and then looking under the leaves, looking at the bark, and all those things. So that really, really shows their interest and you know, even they managed to sort of, you know, look at that small guide we had, you know, those things which was there on the guide, some of the things we had to look for. They were able to find basically most of them, which was pretty cool, yeah. I find this interesting and exciting at the same time. I thought this was a cool way of learning science. <laughs> What really excited me in that video, or the feedback, was that none of them really talked about the digital element of the program. So it's <clears throat> only one person talked about taking a photo, but everyone else was more excited about rummaging around looking for the insects to take a photo of. And that to me I think has been quite a successful element to the program. Um, we've also had schools ask us to come out to, to their school and to um, support them in their own citizen science programs. Um, Ruby's been, I guess, kind of following um, some students who have started to take up iNaturalist and see what they have been recording. Um, one of them was that Kit Harrington photo. And then um, some benefits to natural science, I think, um, if we go back way too many slides, um, just the amount of observations that have increased by, by using iNaturalist. Um, and the observations in the, in the domain have been pretty successful to the natural science team too in their observations. And that takes me to the end. So thank you so much for listening. So any questions for Ruby or Tom? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, um, hey, I was just wondering um, if you learn, like, if you have any sort of learnings about um, science communication or like using this, especially the interaction between the scientist on our naturalist and the kids who might not know the kids kind of thing. Okay, I had quite a new um, revelation with this one that I was there with the kids and I was showing them and describing what they had and like that's how I normally work and it's all really cool and some are really into it. But there was one particular kid, and I was going, yeah, yeah, this is a such and such. And it wasn't into, and I was, I was downloading it on my phone as well. 
but he's kind of half listening to me. But when he saw it on his iPad ping up, when I just identified it online, he was like, oh my gosh, it's a such and such. So to me, that really, I understood that it was, I became more real once I went through a digital um, <laughs> media, <laughs> even though I was right there and I was telling him, but it was only when he saw it on his device that he was like, wow, that's real. So yeah, unusual experience. Anybody else? No? Okay, thanks very much.